Good morning, Massachusetts Pro Start, and good morning to our New Hampshire Pro Start friends as well. We're so happy that everyone could join us this morning for this excellent chef demo from the wonderful chef Ashton Garrett. But you guys don't want to hear from me, so we're going to get right to it. I'm going to throw this right over to Jackie. All right. Well, thank you, Jen, and thank you, Massachusetts Pro Start, for inviting us back. We appreciate all of you tuning in today to cook along with Chef Ashton. And now, um, more than ever, especially during this time, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to be here today, just for you, the future leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, as a note, we'll be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. Please use the chat function at the bottom to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to pose questions to Chef Ashton. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm honored to introduce our chef today. He's a friend, a colleague, and a very talented young culinarian. Chef Ashton Garrett is president of the ACF Young Chefs Club, which includes all ACF members under the age of 25. He's also the USA's Young Chef Ambassador to the World Association of Chef Societies, and he has earned his associate's degree and bachelor's degree from Johnson & Wales University. He is a ProStar Program alumni, and he currently works as Senior Culinary Manager at the Marriott Hotel in Cleveland, Ohio. I could go on and on. I'm very proud of all of his accomplishments, but at this time, I'm going to pass it over to Chef Ashton to tell you a little bit more about himself and his demo today. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, thank you, ACF, and thank you, Massachusetts ProStart, for the honor of doing this tremendous presentation today. Um, we have a lot of great things going on. Uh, I'm going to do a ceviche demonstration, a ceviche de, de pescado to be more specific, and we're also going to do a the French classical crit um, as well. So I'm very excited um, to any of the chefs, the students, um, any alumni of ProStart um, that would feel implored to ask me a question at any time throughout the presentation, please feel free to do so. The more the merrier. Um, I would do my utmost best to, to provide a, a great um, answer for, you, for your questions, but um, just as any great chef, you know, we, we arrive to um, a great concept or great dish by asking questions. So the more you ask, the, the better uh, the response and the, and the better presentation that we're going to have today. So we're going to begin actually um, making our ceviche de pescado. So I'll outline our ingredients that we're going to be using today. So initially, uh, de pescado, ceviche de pescado, pescado meaning fish in um, certain, uh, in, in Latin culture and uh, Spanish culture as well. So first things first we'll need is a high acidity. So this acidity is going to essentially cook our seafood. So which is our fish right here. So um, I opted for lemon juice, a traditional, more, uh, a more traditional recipe uses lime juice. The reason I'm using lemon juice is because of its pH level, pH meaning uh, acidity. Um, anything uh, between seven or lower, sorry, six, seven is neutral on a scale from zero to 14. Anything above seven is more alkaline, which is the healthy kind of acidity that, that we want in our bodies. Um, anything below seven is um, unhealthy to you know, consume in uh, mass amounts. So I'm using lemon juice, which has a pH level of two. And uh, the reason I'm doing that is I, you know, for the purposes of the demonstration, I would kind of want you know, the, uh, the ceviche to cook, quote unquote, cook um, in, a, in a great, in a, in a way that's conducive um, and also um, helps the, the fish break down its cellular um, products as well. So where we have Roma tomatoes, cucumber, habanero pepper for a little bit of heat, cilantro, a name steak and staple in Latin American culture and cuisine, red onion and garlic. And then we'll season everything with just salt and a little bit of pepper. So I did mention that this that this recipe is a basic guideline. So ceviche is, is a wonderful dish because it's uh, so versatile. You can use it for a multitude of different things. Um, it's often used as an appetizer or a palate cleanser. So you might see it, you know, in, in the different institutions, golf clubs, um, hotels use it a lot. Uh, uh, cruise ships often use it because it's, of its versatility. Also. You can use it for um, if you don't want to waste anything. So we use it uh, sometimes in our hotels and in our establishments um, when we have leftover scraps. So when we want to do something fun and creative, we throw it together. So ceviche is a marinated seafood salad. Um, by way of marination, like I said, we use we use our lemon juice. So the first thing we're going to do. So I have my my um, 
my fish right here. This is mahi mahi, often called dolphin fish, or in Spanish dorado, or in the Mediterranean cuisine, it's called manpuca. Um, this is not to be confused with dolphin. Um, a lot of there's a, a a huge misconception out there that you know this is dolphin. This is not. This is dolphin fish. Uh, it has a mild flavor, a very sweet, a great textural balance. So it's going to work extremely well for what we're trying to do today. I chose this fish. Um, because of the lemon juice. Um, and primarily I chose the lemon juice before I chose the mahi-mahi um, because I wanted a fish that, that's gonna stand well with the lemon juice and the acidity and bring it all together. Um, you can also use grouper, snapper, any type of white fish, tilapia, um, snap, like I said, snapper is, is great. Cod is, is also great. So you want something that has kind of more of a body um, because when that lemon juice and that acidity hits, it's going to break down the cellular structures and the enzymes of the fish. And, you know, if you have a, a fish that's kind of more um, a flat fish or a little bit more fragile, it's going to break down rather quickly. And that's not what, what we're trying to achieve. So the first thing we're going to do, lemon juice straight into the bowl. Grab my spoon here. And we're going to marinate, like I said, this is going to essentially cook the mahi-mahi. So we're going to cover it right there. Now, you can use by discretion how much you want to use. I did about a half cup here. Um, and I will... I don't like draining my ceviche. I kind of like it as is. It depends on what you're using it for. You might want to put this as a crostini um, or you, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put it on Boston bib lettuce. So that lettuce is kind of going to absorb the lemon juice. So we're going to set this aside. Once it's all mixed together, I'm going to give that time to marinate or cook in that instance. So while that's occurring, we're going to cut our vegetables, starting with our red onion. Red onion, a great, great, great vegetable. Um, I use it a lot in cooking um, just because of its bold flavor. Um, it's kind of a umami taste. So for the students that are just learning about uh, classical flavors, tastes, and senses, so umami is, is one of those flavor profiles, right? Uh, meaning savory, or it has a mouthfeel or a meaty texture. So uh, onion quite resembles that in terms of uh, just the taste and flavor components. So we're going to shave this in a julienne. So julienne is an eighth of an inch by two inches, or in our case, very thin slices. You can also use a tool called a mandolin. Um, a mandolin allows you to shave down. Um, it's a very sharp, sharp tool, but it allows you to shave down um, without using a knife. So we're going to take our knife, very just slowly shave that onion um, right down. So I have kept my roots intact and a uh, quick tip, you want to keep your root of any onion or um, alum, which is part of the onion family, um, with the classical name, onion family, and that's going to stop it from crying and releasing those, uh, stop you from crying, excuse me, and release those, uh, that acid. Now, an onion is 80% water by weight, so when you cut into it, it naturally releases that acid, and that's how you end up crying. But with the root, it holds in that acid until you're able to finish cutting. Or if you're just beginning, it's no problem. Um, just stick your head in a freezer or chew some gum and, and you'll be <laughs> quite all right. So we'll put this in our bowl. I'm only gonna use half right into our bowl. Reserve the others for another dish I may make or staff meal. Okay. Sebastian, we've had our first question come in from the audience and Wonderful. they were um, wondering if there's a certain ratio that you use for your citrus juice to fish. Sure. So I use uh, one cup of mahi-mahi by weight. I cut it into cubes. Um, I did that for texture um, along with other uh, vegetables, which I'll show you. So the usual ratio that I use um, is one part or one whole to a half part of lemon juice or a half part of acidity. Um, and I do that because of the fermentation process. My fermentation meaning that um, through a chemical process, the, uh, the carbohydrates or enzymes are broken down into a liquid form. So I don't want to actually jeopardize my seafood and actually turn it into like a mush concept. So we want to be able to quite use it um, very well. So uh, from that point, I use one to about one and a half or one fourth, depending on what the acidity is. Like I said, I'm using lemon juice, which is highly acidic. Um, so I don't want to jeopardize it too much, but I'm also um, counterbalancing it with different vegetables that are, are going to absorb that liquid as well. Great. All right. Well, um, just another question too. Someone was wondering if there are any other types of fish 
that sure. uh, you could use. And then also, I just wanted to make an announcement. I know some of the students received the recipes in advance. If you are cooking along with us, um, let us know. You can either raise your hand um, or send the panelists a direct message um, because we'd love to check in if, if you're willing um, and see how your dish is progressing as well. So Jackie, if you wouldn't mind, can you repeat that first question for me? Absolutely. Um, the viewer was wondering if there are different types of fish that you could use to prepare ceviche. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm using mahi-mahi, so the traditional pescada uses um, tilapia, which is a more of a, of a bottom dweller and a bottom dwelling fish. Um, I'm using, like I said, that's uh, mahi-mahi, which is a round fish. So it's subtropical region, um, mahi-mahi in Hawaiian mean um, stiff fish or strong fish. And um, the reason I'm doing this is because of, uh, just because of the, the texture. But you can also use any type of white fish, grouper, cod, snapper. Um, there's a, a fish called, uh, I believe it's sway or, or swai, S-W-A-I, um, which is a great fish. The, the meaning of uh, ceviche is just using, you know, whatever seafood that you have. So ceviche is that, like that seafood marinated salad and ceviche de pescado is fish. So those are some alternatives that you can use as well. And now we're just gonna cut our Roma tomato and our Roma tomato is a fruit um, by classification because of the seeds. Seeds being that it's a berry, so that's why it's called, a, that's why it's named a fruit. And we're just gonna, gonna take those out to a, a, a small, Midway conca, say, if you will, um, outside of cooking our tomato. And we're just going to cut those into relative dices. And the reason I'm doing different textures, um, different textures create different mouthfeel, and different mouthfeel creates different flavor. So I want to expose and actually use my ingredients to their utmost ability. So I have the shaved red onion which provides more thin, but I'm also doing that because of its flavor profile, because of how strong and strong an onion is. Um, when you bite into an onion, I'm sure everybody has, and it has, you know, that, that one big chunk or large chunk, it's kind of a, a unpleasant feeling and taste. So we break that down by, or excuse me, we compensate that by um, shaving it into thin strips or julienning. So from here, we'll dice our tomato. We'll add that into our bowl. And ceviche uh, is a Peruvian dish, the national dish of Peru, phenomenal dish. It was actually first conceived in the late 1800s, excuse me, in the beginning of the 1800s, um, first initially from Spanish culture, so in Spain. So the fishermen in Spain wanted to find different ways of how to eat their seafood that they would catch without actually heating it. Um, so, so, you know, being in Spain, they have an abundance of uh, lemons and citrus um, because of the terroir or their, their climate and region. So they decided to use the acidity to cook their seafood and that made its way over to Peru. So from here, we're going to cut our cucumber. I'm only going to use half of it just by ratio. And I'm going to cut it in half once more. I'm going to do quarter moon slices. So from our top, just much like our onion, cut it down. So I'm playing with different shapes, textures, sizes, and this is all going to come together when we finish our ceviche. Great, Chef Ashton, we had another question come in and they were asking um, what size you did for the cuts on the fish. Sure, so I did, as you can see, I'll show you in this camera. I'll show you which camera, okay. So uh, roughly about, a, um, I say about a Macedon um, or a rough chop, so kind of like a medium dice, I would say. So I did this because um, just for, for texture, as you can see, so we want to do like cuts, like sizes, like shapes, um, just as any type of cooking process, um, especially when it cooks, you want to do relative shapes and sizes um, just for the timing of the cooking. Actually, we're not cooking this. Um, by heat method per se. Um, so we're allowing the play of different flavors and textures to come through. So I'd say about a master's on or a medium dice. 
Great. And I love all these questions. One of the other viewers would like to know um, why it is that you removed um, the seeds. Um, great, great. That is an excellent question. Um, I actually did this dish when I had the opportunity to travel abroad in Spain. And um, I asked that question too as well, why, why, uh, why I was taking the seeds out. And my professor came up with an interesting point. He said, um, you know, when you bite into a tomato, um, the first thing that hits your, your mouth is the skin or the tannins. And then from there, the flesh. Um, the seeds is kind of an afterthought. Um, and from there, you know, from a ceviche standpoint, when we made this dish, it just didn't make sense for the seeds to be in there. Just it distracted away from the mouthfeel. So that's why I take mine out for the seeds. It has nothing really to do with um, the flavor, but it also has to do with everything uh, in terms of mouthfeel and coming up with the texture. So I only used half of my cucumber, which is perfectly fine um, in terms of ratio. The others we can use for you know a chopped salad or if we're doing another ceviche. So it's perfectly acceptable um, in terms of that. And then from here, I'm gonna to switch and do a cut our habanero pepper. So this is a very, very hot pepper. Um, I recommend that you use gloves if you don't have gloves. Um, there's a, you can mix salt water with uh, lemon juice and a little bit of water and dip your hand into that and hold uh, the pepper. If for any instance that you have an irritation or burning sensation, um, do not use water to wash your hands or to eradicate the the, uh, the sensation, the heat sensation, use rubbing alcohol or vinegar um, that the high acidity will actually kill the heat, um, whereas water kind of agitates it. So that's that's what we're trying to go for. So from here, we're going to just shave down our size, much like how we would do any pepper, keeping away from the seeds. Again, um, depending on how hot you want this, how spicy you, know, you, you are in terms of toleration, you can keep the seeds in. The seeds are the hottest part of any pepper. And... We're just going to do a small dice, more so like a mint or about a broom walk. And again, if I were to leave this um, as is, as whole right now in these small julienne strips, um, they will just be unpleasant to the taste and, and mouthfeel. So we're going to cut them down a little bit just to make sure that everything is in proportion. Excellent. And we had another question come in. Um, the viewer um, is not a fan of spiciness. They were wondering sure. um, if they could leave this out or if they could substitute a different pepper um, or what you might recommend. Yes, yes, yes. This, um, the, the pepper is uh, just an additive, just like much of the other vegetables, but um, you do not have to add it in. If you opt out for a more mild pepper, um, jalapeno, it's, it's kind of mild depending on, on where you are in the country or in the world. You can't go wrong with bell pepper bread. Uh, orange, yellow, green, those are the mild flavors. Um, poblanos are also kind of mild as well. So if you don't like a lot of heat, that's perfectly fine. Um, I will say you can also add avocado um, to this dish. Avocado green uh, brings a creamy texture as well as that umami flavor and that freshness to the dish without compromising its heat profile. And we'll just cut this down ever so slightly. Perfect. Well, I love seeing all these questions come in. Another one is about the ratio that you use of fish to vegetable. Is there a certain ratio or is that up to personal taste? That's up to personal taste, uh, Jackie. And whoever asked that question, I'm I'm a vegetable guy. Um, so I, I love vegetables, especially in, in more, more seafood dishes. Um, there is not, not a particular ratio. Again, we want to make sure that it's consistent in terms of proportion. You know, if um, the dish is called ceviche de pescado, so we're highlighting the fish in this dish. So we want the fish to kind of come through, but we also want the other vegetables to complement the fish, to complement the dish in ways that um, come together, right? So from here, I don't have a specific ratio. I just do um, about a half a cup of, of each vegetable in terms of the bulkier vegetables, my tomato, cucumber, and onion. And um, for my smaller vegetables, the habanero pepper, my cilantro, um, like it's kind of minimal in terms of, of that in that regard. So it's, um, it just depends on, on, on what, you're, what you're trying to do and what you're trying to, trying to go for in terms of vegetables. So from here, so from here, I'm just gonna cut my cilantro. So I'm gonna just remove the stems and we're gonna boil this 
I'm tying it with a tight ball and compress it down and just shave it. This doesn't have to be a full on, you know, a rustic shop or mince. We just kind of want to break the tannins, break the fibers within a cilantro. Um, Spanish dishes, uh, me, as well as Peruvian dishes, um, they're kind of rustic in nature. So, you know, not a lot of finesse and, and the finite detail. Um, we just want to make sure that the flavors and the colors, um, as well as the texture, uh, shows through tremendously. So this is about, I'm gonna add two tablespoons cilantro. Cilantro is also a very spicy um, herb. So you wanna use it in moderation, um, but it's gonna go completely well with the lemon juice and acidity from the um, ceviche. So now that we've completed that, all our vegetables are cut, our salad has been made. We're gonna to add in our fish, mix it entirely. So we're gonna add our vegetables into our ceviche. So the reason that I'm adding in this way instead of the, my seafood into my vegetables, I want my vegetables to introduce themselves into the lemon juice first, rather than a lemon juice kind of permeating onto my vegetables. So from here, we add it in. And again, guys, um, it just depends on how long you marinate it usually. Um, I, I would not probably consume this right now just because I would like it for more, further marination. Um, usually about an hour to two hours is the more applicable way. In terms of ceviche, it can hold up to two days within your refrigerator. Um, you wanna serve it cold right immediately as soon as you make it. And it all just depends on you know, who you're serving for. Again, this is a, a great dish, extremely versatile. Um, you can use it lunch, entree. I've even seen it in some cultures, they, they eat this in breakfast. Um, it's it's a, an all around, just a phenomenal dish. So we, we're playing on different flavors. So we have the sweetness from the tomato, the umami from the onion, the lemon juice brings everything together. Uh, the cilantro helps. Now we're gonna season. And the reason I didn't season the fish prior to this is simply because salt is a flavor enhancer. Um, I'm adding about a teaspoon of salt. Salt is a flavor enhancer. So that means it strips away the moisture and um, releases the juices into whatever it's, it's um, accompanying. So we want to season last. All right. So from here, we're going to continue to mix. I'm sorry, Jackie, what were you saying? Uh, we, do, we do have, we have lots of questions coming in, which is fabulous. I love it. Sure. Um, one of them was, um, and you may be getting to this, but the question came in of how long um, do you need to let it marinate? Presentation, um, it's, you really want to let it marinate. Probably you want to cover this fish, right? Again, for the demonstration purposes, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to consume this, but um, we're, we're just going to make this. You want to probably let it marinate for about 45 minutes to an hour um, because that lemon juice, it can withstand that temperature, excuse me, that time. Whereas lime juice, you want to let it go a little bit longer because of its pH level. So about 45 minutes to an hour with lemon juice, a longer for lime juice. You can even let it uh, overnight, the marination overnight, and then consume it the next day. That's always a, a great tip. We do that in, in our establishments as well. So for this, it's um, which whatever you do, you just want to eat it as soon as it comes out. Um, very fresh serve it, you know, because it's, it's still raw in nature. Um, you want to serve it before, you know, any, any, uh, any illness might, might construe from it. Sure. And I do have another question, not to put you on the spot, but um, I can see Please. that your, your former instructor from Johnson & Wales is tuning in as well to... Uh, Who's to that? Uh, Chef Lazar. Is Chef here. Lazar. <laughs> um, and he was wondering um, if you had a recommendation um, of what type of knife is um, is best to to cut your ship. Wow, out. great, great question, Chef. Great question. It suits you since since you were my my carving and, and uh, meat fabrication instructor. Um, I use a, a, a shun. This is a shun chef knife, eight by ten. I also use uh, Masano. Uh, Masano has become a, a favorite brand of mine. Um, my, my parents kind of helped me out on that. You know, Christmas and birthdays, you know, I, I usually get a knife. So, um, but it really just matters to you. You know, comfortability. You don't have to have an extravagant knife, an overly expensive knife, um, something that's going to take you know um, 
you know, break your, your pockets or anything like that. Just whatever's comfortable for you, you know, learn how to, um, to, to use it properly, learn how to respect the knife, you know, respect um, its ability and capability. And, um, but yeah, so, you know, we started off with Mercer. Um, I know um, F Dick is, is a great brand as well. Um, there's just a multitude of brands um, that, are, that are great. I, I use a Shun, I, more Japanese style knives, but it just depends on your comfortability. So essentially after this is done marinating, right? And, and we've seasoned everything, um, the ceviche, of course, where we would taste it and, and assess if we need more lime juice, more acidity, you can always add in. Um, you can never take out. That's one of the first things I actually learned in culinary school. So less is more um, in terms of, and it can go a long way. So you want to just use your discretion. If you like things a little bit saltier, then absolutely, by all means, add more salt. I mean, uh, if you like things more, you know, more spicy, you can always add in, especially a salad. So from here, we're going to plate up. So I'll show you my plate. So I have a little bit of toasted bread here. And um, I have these two dishes that I've used Boston bib lettuce as well. That's going to be my base. Like I said, that's going to help uh, absorb the, the moisture. And from here, we're just going to fill in our, our small little cups. And you can use, you know, I've seen martini dishes, um, like I said, a crostini's. Um, there's just just a plethora of different things that you can use um, as well in terms of creating your dish and also allowing the ceviche to, to, to show through. So we have just as an example, that will be our, our first. And this will be as a, you know more so of an appetizer or if you have a, uh, a dinner, dinner party, kind of use that. So um, I found these dishes actually on Amazon. Um, a friend of mine recommended them to me and I think they, they, uh, they did quite well. I've actually used them the first time as for tiramisu. And uh, from there, just thought I would show you all about the ceviche dish. Uh, I love ceviche, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. My first ever experience was actually at the ACF Conve National Convention in Orlando, I wanna say in 2016, 2017, forgive me for not knowing, um, but uh, I, I came right off the plane, uh, headed to the resort in which the convention was held, and um, the national president of the Young Chefs Club at the time, you know, say, Ashton, hey, how you doing, man? It's, it's great to meet you. Uh, by the way, in 20 minutes, you have, um, yeah, yeah, you, you're going to compete in our ceviche competition. Um, didn't really know much about it up until that point, so I, I'm running back to my hotel room on Google at the same time, trying to scramble to learn about ceviche and. Um, it was it was a great experience. Um, we actually did a watermelon ceviche, so where we used a, a little bit of watermelon juice as well as lemon juice to to ferment, uh, excuse me, to marinate our ceviche. So this is our ceviche right here. Um, I would love to see um, what, what uh, if the chefs are, are cooking along, the students that are cooking along, uh, what those might look like. But this is just a, a classical approach to ceviche. Again, uh, it can hold up into your fridge for about two to close to three days, um, but you definitely want to serve it as fresh as possible. Jackie, are there any questions uh, about ceviche? No, not right now. I think everyone's uh, coming up with their own concepts of how they're going to make it their own when they uh, try out um, your techniques. But the plate uh, looks beautiful. I, I wish I was there right now. <laughs> not a problem at all. So now um, we've created our ceviche. So our second our second um, phase of this presentation is more of a savory dessert, which is a French classical crepe. So a crepe is a ultra thin French pancake. Um, the reason uh, it, it deviates from that of any other cuisine's pancake, right? You know, there's there's latkes, there's you know just so many different other pancakes. I think every culture or cuisine has their own variation of pancake, um, but it differs from American pancakes in that it doesn't use a leavening agent. Um, so it's just you know, batter that you can actually find in your house. It just requires, you know, uh, a couple of ingredients, eggs, sugar, at times sugar, salt, flour, and butter. So we're going to create our crepe. But first, I'm going to start with our filling. So this is a blueberry mac mascarpone filling. Slide in my camera a little bit over here so you all can see this. So this is a, a tremendous filling. I made this when on my study abroad in Italy, um, and I had the tremendous pleasure of, of uh, cultivating the recipe as well. So 
Uh, we're going to utilize blueberries, a little bit of water, uh, granulated sugar, fresh orange juice. It's important that we use fresh, not concentrated, because we kind of want some of the pulp and the tannins. Um, that's extra flavor. Orange zest and uh, basil. So basil is a very delicate, leafy um, herb, and it you know requires some some level of skill and, and attention to when we're cooking. So we want to definitely want to be careful when we're using basil. Um, it's a tremendous herb. Easily one of my favorites. Um, I use it, you know, quite often in cooking. I use a lot of herbs in cooking, but um, there, you can supplement. You know, sage is another great herb to use um, when when you're using uh, when you're cooking with, with different things like that. So um, you just want to. It all depends on on how you want to uh, utilize your herbs. So we'll begin with that. So I'm going to add in. I have my saucepan medium heat. Add in my blueberries. Y'all see that? Okay, perfect. perfect. I'm just gonna move this up here. Chef okay. Ashton, one of the questions that had come in um, is sure. about um, how did you become president of the ACF Young Chefs Club? Right, so um, that's a great question, Jackie. So I initially started as uh, just much like the students on this call in high school, kind of eager you know, to get, to get out there and experience um, a multitude of the culinary industry, the diversity, the, the networking, just, I just had a, a plethora of excitement. And um, uh, actually my mother discovered the ACF when I was in high school and we had a local chapter here in Ohio and I went for the first meeting um, and I loved everything about it. You know, there was just the camaraderie, the chefs, the, the diversity in terms of, you know, culture, um, you know, uh, race, ethnicity, background. It was just, you know, an acceptance for me and um, an eye opener for me to to uh, to be part of you know a, a group such as that, and uh, from there I kind of just stuck with it. Um, I was nominated to be the ACF, the first ever um, board of ACF Young Chefs Club nominations. Um, I was served as an Eastern Regional Vice President um, for I believe from 2016, 2018, or 2017, 2018. Uh, I, I remember it was a yearly tenure. And then uh, I promoted, I was promoted, I should say, to ambassador. And uh, recently, just recently, I was appointed, appointed uh, to national president. And it's been a complete honor. I've enjoyed every single second of it. Um, I'm, I'm very blessed um, in, in, uh, in trying to cultivate different relationships and, and recruit other young chefs who are as eager as myself, or even have some have some uh, some leniencies and, and question are questionable about organizations. But um, this has been a tremendous um, endeavor of mine as well. So now we've just added blueberries. We're going straight in with our sugar. I'm gonna mix that. We're gonna bring this to a boil as quickly as we can. We want that sugar to alter, uh, excuse me, to activate in the water, break down those blueberries. We're not gonna cover this. Um, cover creates evaporation. And condensation, it creates condensation, so we, we don't want that to happen. And uh, we're going to add in our orange juice now as well. Again, this is acidic, but not as highly as acidic as our lemon juice or lime juice. So this is going to also help break down the blueberries. And as I mentioned, when we were doing the ceviche, salt is a extract. So we're going to add about a pinch of salt. That's also going to help extract and break down that blueberry flavor. So I'm going to bring that up to a boil as quickly as possible. And while that's occurring, uh, so I'm using mascarpone. Uh, mascarpone is a great cheese, one of my favorites, actually, that and feta and also goat cheese. Um, so this is more of a sweet, creamy texture, um, a little bit creamier than uh, cream cheese, and it folds in very nicely. Uh, you see it a lot with uh, dessert fillings, you know, they use it also in, um, in cannolis in terms of substitutions. So we're gonna, we're gonna use that as well. And the reason I'm not doing, I'm not adding my zest and I'm also not adding my basil in this cooking process because this is a very delicate herb as I once mentioned. And if I add it in the, in the beginning of the cooking process, not only do we break it down and also degrade its nature, um, but we're also not maximizing its flavor. So as well as the orange zest because it's so pungent. We kind of want it to be that last minute pop and, and it's gonna bring everything together. 
So from here, I have about five to six basil leaves, large to small in the beginning, right? And from here, I'm going to roll it as all of us know, um, or should know, I should say, or, or might be learning, which is perfectly acceptable. We're going to roll it into a cigar shape. And this helps us control the basil as well as keep it from breaking down. So ideally, sharp knives are going to help with this process. And just, you know, go slow, a small julienne. And now we keep everything clean. It's on the board. We have full ribbon shapes. We have exposed the tannins. So that basil flavor is coming out quite, quite nicely. And if you have a little bit of green on your board, uh, simply just sharpen your knife or, or get a, you know, a steel or a stone or a sharpening tool. And that's going to allow you to uh, get more consistent cuts with that. So now that our filling is working, we're going to transition into actually making our crepe batter. So this is one of my favorite recipes. This is a traditional crepe batter. Um, I'm going to use all purpose flour. Now in France, the traditional crepe, uh, savory I should say, uses buckwheat flour. Um, buckwheat is for savory crepes versus all purpose or whole wheat is for dessert crepes. The reason why buckwheat has more gluten and more gluten enzymes. So um, when you have savory, it often includes more moisture or more intensified flavor. So the buckwheat complements that very well. So we're gonna start in on a, about medium heat. We're gonna melt our butter, two tablespoons of butter, right in. And from here, grab my bowl. I have my one cup of flour. And now we have this at a boil. Wonderful, we're gonna actually turn the heat down to a simmer and let that simmer for five minutes. So if you can see, I'll mix it around for a bit. Our blueberries have broken down. That mixture has, has just completely broken down, which is wonderful. Now we're just gonna reduce our liquid. Reducing means taking a larger volume um, and turning it down to a smaller volume. So while that's happening, uh, I have a sieve, pastry sieve right here, straight into our bowl. all-purpose flour. We're going to go straight in. Again, this is one cup of all-purpose flour. We want this to be as fine as possible. Um, not, we don't want too many clumps um, because the lumps are just extra gluten and they won't break down well in our batter. Again, we don't have a leavening agent in this batter, so we want to make sure that this is as fine as possible. And we'll just discard those cups. We're going to go in straight away with a about one fourth of a teaspoon of salt. Now for this, um, we're going to add in our sugar as well. So the reason we add in our sugar in this particular recipe, uh, main so is because it, it's uh, of the batter. If um, if there's any pastry chefs or pastry students on here, I'm sure you all know that sugar is actually a liquid ingredient. So it should go with um, the, li the liquid ingredients when we do our separation. But since we're making a batter, we're going to mix everything on as one. So we're gonna mix that around, give that a mix. Actually use my whisk here. Chef Ashton, now, the, if you don't yes. mind, we do have another question. Um, and sure. that was, um, one of the viewers was wondering if there were any vegetarian or vegan alternatives to both of these dishes, what you might recommend. Sure. So for the uh, the crepe, um, it's extremely versatile. Um, you can actually make this completely vegan without the butter and just substitute with you know almond butter or um, there's uh, different clarified butters, plant-based butters that you can use. So we, we take that out the question in terms of that. Um, if you want to add in something savory instead, um, I've seen Spanish, I've seen spinach, garlic, tomato, um, the fillings are endless in crepes. Um, you can just add add anything that, that you would like. Ceviche is kind of on the, on the different hand um, because of the name, it's, it's using seafood. Um, but 
there's no problem if you want to add in, you know, um, a difference in terms of um, a different seafood or, or just take it out all together and just marinate your vegetables and just leave it like that. So that's, that's completely fine. So we have our flour beautifully sifted, mixed well together. We're going to start with our second, our larger bowl. We're going to add in two eggs. We crack on our countertop or cutting board rather than cracking on our bowl um, not to expose bacteria into our dish. Now you can also make a well in the middle of your flour and whisk your eggs in that way. Um, I believe I, I wrote that actually in the recipe. I'm going to show you, you know, a different concept um, as well, just so it's just more continuity and structure. And if you um, have a shell into your eggs, not a problem. Just wet your hands or actually use part of the eggshell and you can pluck it right out. So we're gonna give that a, a nice whisk just to break the yolks. Then from here, I'm gonna grab my milk. So a, a crepe, the, uh, the derivation or the, the origin of crepe is actually from Latin American structure, uh, meaning crispa which is actually curled. So it's, it's very important that, you know, we, we know the history and origins of different foods and uh, we're able to, you know, build from there, you know, just like our ancestors have developed different flavors and profiles that we've been able to manipulate and take, um, much like our knowing our history is extremely important. So from here, we're gonna mix in that milk, right with our eggs, absolutely perfect. And now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna mix everything together. So we add little by little um, to avoid any of those clumps being formed. So I'm gonna go about a quarter of the mixture in, and we're gonna mix that and we're gonna kind of get like more, okay, like a gum kind of paste, a little bit more. So you just low and slow, you have complete control over this. We don't, again, we don't wanna add it in all together um, just because this is a very thin batter, a loose batter. And if we were able to add it all in, we risk the chance of um, developing gluten which means the tightening of that flour and we don't have a, a, a nice thin crepe that we're, that we're trying to use as well. All right. Well, we do have a couple of questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, one of the viewers has asked um, if almond milk might work um, or if you've tried Yes. That. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've tried that. I, I tried, uh, I made a, a, v, a vegan recipe. Um, I can also send this to uh, Jen, who's on this call as well, um, and she can distribute out to the students. Um, a, a vegan recipe that uses almond milk, uh, almond butter. Completely, um, I use actually um, unbleached flour and it, it came out completely great. Um, so the, it's just a, a different derivation on, on types of what you're trying to do. So I'm gonna add in that butter that we melted. We're gonna continue to mix, continue to mix. And finish. So the concept of this, you kind of want it to be in between water and a sauce. So not, you know, nappe, meaning the uh, it coats the back of the spoon, but more so kind of liquidy. Not, not too thick, definitely not too thin. Um, just, like I said, just around that liquid base. So we're going to let this rest, let those bubbles kind of subdue, get away. And from here, we're gonna start with, now our berries have reduced beautifully. I'm going to actually get this bowl, get my mascarpone cream ready. Mascarpone right into, again, this is a great cheese to use, a soft cheese. It's got a, a mild flavor. Um, it takes well to whatever you, you know, you're cooking with. So, um, I use it often, you know, you can also substitute with goat cheese. If you don't even want cheese in this filling, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can use, you know, just the 
classical crepe just uses lemon and um, you know usually just a lemon and sugar. So that's perfectly fine as well. We're gonna add in our orange zest. Now those basil leaves that we were able to cut, let's add those in as well. And since we've already salted this to help extract the blueberries, we don't need to salt it again. Now from this process, um, because that water is still there, which is perfectly that liquid, we're going to just run this through our sieve just ever so slightly. Just to separate the blueberries from some of that liquid. And we're going to repurpose that liquid back into a marshmallow cake. And I do this um, just to kind of measure out and understand where I am in terms of how much liquid I'm using in terms of ratio. You know, too much liquid can, especially hot liquid, can damage that cream. And, excuse me, damage that uh, the mascarpone cheese. And from here, nice spoon right down, and we're just going to fold some of that blueberries right in. Added that liquid in. You can already see together. Very beautiful. Kind of creating that, that creamy texture. Do you have any questions? Yes, we do, but I didn't want to interrupt. I was mesmerized. Oh, um, no, you're fine. <laughs> Uh, one of the questions um, that we had um, come in from one of the educators was um, about your future career goals. Um, yes. So as it stands right now, um, I work for Merit International, a tremendous company. Um, I, I've been afforded a, a great opportunity to be able to work for them. Um, I kind of have my sights as right now to, you know, once uh, the coronavirus is over to uh, begin traveling again. Um, I would definitely love to, you know, start traveling again and, and expose myself to more cultures and, and um, more taste and flavors. So from that aspect, you know, I think, um, you know, fine dining has always been in, in my, in my, uh, in my repertoire and, and kind of my dreams of pursuing. So that's what I kind of want to use uh, to help guide me and, uh, you know, just, just fulfill that, that passion. So definitely, um, I would say certification is big on my on, on my mind. Uh, competition, competing is, is huge. Um, I also want to you know just just help other young chefs you know achieve their their truest potential and, and value um, into this culinary industry that's changing every every day. So we you know we want to be part of that um, and just help the next generation of chefs. Excuse me, just wiping out my pen just a little bit. Next generation of chefs um, develop that that uh, that great professionalism and and uh, great rapport. So for me, you know, it's just all about what is that next step, you know, in my culinary journey, you know, whether it's competing or certifications, you know, whatever that looks like, you know, I just want to make sure it's genuine and just be a part of it. So um, Michelin is, is, is probably definitely on, on, on my eye too, you know, kind of want to want to dab into that a little bit, but uh, you know, the, the opportunities are endless. And for any student watching this, you know, you don't have to pigeonhole yourself. There are no limitations. You, you yourself are always going to be your own limitation. Um, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, I'm a true believer of that. I'm a true testament of that. And, um, you know, if for any of you that would like to reach out, you know, I, I'm always on social media and on my platforms and I would love to love to be helping, you know, you and, and uh, if you need mentorship. You know, I've been blessed to know a lot of great mentors, much like Chef Lazar. And if he's on this call, Chef Stephen Beatty, who's also uh, ACF alumni as well. Uh, and Chef Samuel Spencer, you know, those, those uh, three in particular have definitely helped me so much. And from here, we're just going to wrap up with our crepe. Finally, our mixture, our blueberry mixture is done. It's, it's setting. So I'm going to let that relax a little bit. I'm just put a little bit of butter into the pan. We don't want to overbear it um, and create a thin casing or a thick casing. So we just want to kind of move it around. You can also dip with your pastry brush. If you have a brush at home, kind of just spread that out. A nonstick pan is going to work well. Um, something that has low sides. Uh, they also have specialized crepe pans, which is, again, just uh, another non-stick pan, but just with, with lower slope sides. So we have our batter, which is rested. I'm going to take my ladle here, give it one smooth mix once more. 
again, we just want this to be porous, you know, not too thick, definitely not too thin. And we're gonna go right into our pan. I have my pan on a low to medium heat right now. Make sure it's on. And we're just gonna take about a ladle or about one third cup. I put mine at the end and then one swift motion to make sure it's covered fully. And we'll let that set. And this is probably gonna take about 30 seconds to a minute to 30 seconds. Um, just so when we see the crepe batter begin. So what we're looking here is basically like small bubbles to kind of subside. Um, and also we want the ends to kind of crisp up. Again, the meaning of crepe is, is the crisp or the, the curl of our flour. So uh, that's what we're cooking essentially um, in this crepe. So if you have something thin, you just move it around and we just let it let it do its thing, let it touch. This is on, uh, again, medium, medium to low to medium heat. We have our mascarpone cream ready to go, and we're getting ready to plate. So again, um, you know, with this dish, there's just uh, endless possibilities that you can do with crepes. Um, the uh, the national day for crepes, February second, I believe it's called uh, Legendor Crepe. Uh, forgive me for, for not for not remembering that, but um, it's a, it was first conceived back in you know the seven seven hundreds. Um, and, you know, pilgrims, French pilgrims were on their way to Rome and, and they offered themselves crepes. So that's how, you know, the, the National French Day of Crepes is February 2nd. Um, it kind of got Americanized through a chef called uh, Emmy, um, Emmy Savoy? No, Emmy Wada, excuse me, Emmy Wada um, in New York. She was a, a baker who studied in Paris, France and came over to, uh, to New York and she made something called a Mie crepe, which is a thousand crepes. Well, um, in all reality, it's just 20, 20 crepes stacked on top of each other um, with pastry cream in between. And that kind of just acknowledged an entire slew of um, a crepes in terms of um, it being acknowledged as a, as a, a namestay. So in Paris, France, you, or excuse me, in France in general, you can see crepes as a street food. You can also see it in fine dining. Um, the more fine dining version is called Crepe Suzette. Uh, crepe Suzette uses uh, an orange liqueur which is uh, just a, a, a small, a strong tannin built on fermented orange um, oranges. And what that does is when you're building the crepe, um, when your, your crepe is finally made and is folded, you would take your orange liqueur and ignite it during a process called flambe, which means to ignite the alcohol or to burn the alcohol out. And from there, you would just build your crepe on that and caramelize that orange liqueur. Um, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal dish. Um, and it's, it's very tasty as well. So we're almost there with our crepe. Uh, I'm doing a, a, a lower process, um, a longer process, I should say, just with my heat. This is perfectly fine. So you can start to see it kind of rise up a little bit and give it some give. And once that you know happens, then you're almost there. You want to make sure that the entire crepe is done, and then we'll give it a nice flip. And you can also peek, you know, underneath and, and see how it's doing, but. Ideally, you just want to let it do its thing and, and cook for sure. All right. Well, well, great. Well, Chef Ashton, I hope I, you don't mind me interrupting again. Uh, no, no, no. But um, I, I, we, we know you've done a lot so far. You've, you, you've had the opportunity to study abroad, and um, you've been um, uh, doing so many great things. You won Guy's Grocery Games recently, yes. which is pretty awesome. Yes. Yes, um, yes. Um, one of the students, and we'd love to hear about that too, but one of the um, students has asked um, how, how old you are and how long you've been working in the industry. Um, a great question. Uh, I'm currently 23 years old. Um, I started in the industry when I was 15. Um, my first ever job, I was a deep cleaner, um, I, which is lower in the brigade than a dishwasher. You know, it's, you, you kind of just consider the, the end all be all in terms of you know, your utility worker, you know, whenever they need you to do something, that's what you do. And um, it was an experience like no other. One, I was in the kitchen, um, although I wasn't working with food like some of the chefs um, that, that were behind in the hotline that I wanted to you know, emulate and kind of you know, be and see myself one day doing, it taught me humility. It also taught me you know, dedication and it also taught me patience. Um, I knew that you know, in order to, uh, to run, I first needed need to learn how to walk and to even learn how to walk, I, I first need to learn how to crawl. So it was a steady progression um, in terms of, to me, to get into this position that I am today. And I'm very blessed for those other experiences, although they might've been, you know, daunting and frustrating at times, you know, it, it definitely afforded me a great amount of humility, uh, as well as diligence and determination. 
And so we're gonna check our crep. So it's bubbling up, giving some give. I'm gonna give it about 30 more seconds and then we'll give it a nice flip. Uh, these are, again, very delicate, so you really want to just be careful. Um, I'm using an offset spatula. If you don't have an offset spatula, um, that's perfectly fine. A pastry spatula would do just well. Some chefs actually just use their hands. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, and that's perfectly fine. You know, that, that kind of takes years of, of practice and, and delicacy. Um, then that's that's quite all right. You know, it just depends on your level of comfortability. You know, you don't have to force anything that you don't want to do. And, um, you know, if something comes natural to you, it comes natural to you. And, and, and from that point, you know, you can just be um, just be yourself and, and be free with it. And if I did not mention, uh, we're going to fold this crepe, not roll it. So the traditional way, especially in American cuisine, is actually to roll it. I'm um, using a tongue fork. But in France, uh, we actually fold it. Um, we're going to fold it in half and then in half again. So the reason we do that is to make sure our filling stays intact and, um, and also creates a more consistent uh, textural product. So from here, this, see what we're doing. Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna turn my heat down a little bit. And you really just wanna do one swift motion with the crepe. So we're gonna lift it up. If you don't feel comfortable using your hand, because they are so delicate, you can also use, like I said, that, uh, that pastry, that pastry uh, spatula. Just gonna make sure it's ready to turn. So we're gonna lift up, hold it on one end. And again, it's just gonna be one swift motion. If you don't, if you have gloves, you can also put gloves on um, to make you know the process seamless and more easier. That's perfectly fine. So we're just gonna take our offset spatula and flip. and from here, you can also fix it and rearrange it. Um, the way it needs to be. So this crepe, actually, I could have let it go on a little bit longer, but it's perfectly fine. And we're going to let it cook on that side for about 30 seconds. Turn the heat back on, let it cook for about 30 seconds. So um, this is one of my favorite dishes, desserts, brownies, crepes, and ice cream. Uh, probably some of my, my most favorite. Um, you can't go wrong with them. You know, they're a delight to have. Um, like I said, they're just, uh, especially crepes, you know, just extremely versatile and, and just, um, I, I love it, you know, very much. So, and. Fabulous. Um, this, this just looks, I mean, it looks delicious and um, you're, you're doing a wonderful job. Um, I know that, um, you know, if we're, we're gonna get close to time. So if there's any last minute questions, mm -hmm. those, we apologize if we don't get to all of them. Um, but while you're continuing to um, uh, have that crate cook a little bit, um, I will probably then talk about our upcoming webinars that we have. Um, Ashton will be joining us again. We have a Young Chefs Club uh, webinar in uh, collaboration with Massachusetts Restaurant Association and ProStart. That'll be on um, January 28th. Um, yeah, yes. and, um, and so we're very excited about that. Um, you know, you, you all asked and, and we listened. So we heard that you wanted to learn more about food trucks. And so we have some great chefs who are going to talk about um, business insights and what it's like to be a food truck chef. That conversation will be moderated by Chef Ashton. Um, so we hope that you'll, that you will join us and tune in for, um, for that uh, webinar as well. And um, I know that Ashton also mentioned some, um, uh, that one of his goals was certification, if that is um, someone else's interest as well. ACF does have 15 levels of certification, um, even a level that you can earn in high school. So um, please do consider joining us for our other webinar, which will be um, a certification webinar. This one isn't just for students, it's for, for, for professionals as well. That will be on January 25th with um, the Certification Commission Chair, Chef John Shaw. So um, we are certainly looking forward to hearing your feedback about this presentation and about what it is that you all would like to learn. Uh, we're definitely here from you, you, for you are the future of our culinary industry. So please do let Jen know 
um, and let us know as well about what you would like to see, what you would like to learn so that we can make this series as interesting as possible for you. So I will um, turn it back over to you, Chef Ashton. Yes, and um, actually while you were talking, Jack, I just, I'm sorry, I just finished the, the crepe. So I just uh, finished my, the crepe, if you can see it. So I just added a little bit of three strawberries and uh, finished the crepe uh, with the four fold and the blueberry cream. And that's, you know, you can add powdered sugar, a little bit of chocolate uh, sauce if you like, but again, uh, the opportunity, you know, the, the, um, the crepe is endless. The food is, is just endless. Um, and I implore every young chef, um, I'm just going to take about a couple minutes just, just to talk about that. Um, you know, if you're a young chef, you know, sitting at, at, at home or um, at your, your uh, respected institutions or uh, high schools or whatever, you know, wherever you are, um, just continue to pursue. Um, I know that times are in despair right now, but they're not going to be like this forever. Um, just continue to elevate. Um, there's a, one of my mentors um, actually told me this a long time ago when I was in high school. He said, it's rather, it's rather better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared at all. So just continue to work, continue to grow, continue to elevate, um, and, and just have fun doing it. You know, food knows no gender, no race, no discrimination. It just only knows to be enjoyed. So, um, you know, with that, there are no rules, there are no limitations. Just respect the food, you know, respect, you know, the, the mahi mahi, respect, you know, it gave its life to be on the plate. Respect, you know, the, um, the, the strawberries, respect, just respect the food, and, and also respect yourself. We are masters of our craft, and, and, we, and we love to do what we do. So. Thank you so much, uh, Massachusetts Pro Star. Thank you so much, ACF. This was a tremendous presentation. I'm beyond um, excited and honored to be here. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And a huge virtual round of applause um, as we chef, uh, thank Chef Ashton for being here and for sharing with you. I know how stressful it is to be on the other side of that camera, Chef. <laughs> um, we certainly thank you so much um, and great mise en place too. That was great to see. Thank you so much. Yes, um, so we look forward to um, seeing all of you student chefs, educators, professionals on um, some of our upcoming ACF webinars um, and any way that we can be a resource to you. Uh, for more inspiration for culinary news, please check out our uh, site, wearechefs.com. Um, and um, beyond, on, on behalf of ACF National Office, um, thank you to Massachusetts Pro Start for this opportunity to be here. Thank you to Chef Ashton, and thank you all for joining us today. We'll look forward to seeing you real soon, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Thank you.